Empire. Hello and welcome to a Victory Podcast, sponsored by Lono Coffee. Visit LonoCoffee.com, use promo code COFFEE2020 for a discount, and that's L-O-N-E-O-A-K, coffee.com. Today, we talk about a season-opening win. How about that? I'll give you my observations from Washington's 27-17 win over Philadelphia, and then my buddy Mike Jones from USA Today and the Football Jones Podcast joins me to go over the comeback win. Don't forget, you can read my work on ESPN.com. I have a story up now about the win, and I'll have another on the pass rush defensive line on Monday. You can also go back and read my story about Alex Smith's journey this summer to earning a roster spot. Some good quotes from a lot of different voices about his journey. Before I share my conversation with Mike Jones, here are my observations on Sunday's win. Let's start with Ron Rivera. There is a dramatic difference between he and Jay Gruden, and it showed today. It's not just that they came back. Washington had some comeback wins under Gruden as well, but it's the way Rivera handles things that stood out. He is a firm disciplinarian who wants to develop a relationship with players, but he's also not trying to be their buddy. He's much more like a firm parent. He'll have fun with you when it calls for it, but he's, he's there to work, and he's going to get on you when it's time to get on you. Sunday, when the team was down 17 nothing, and talking to some people who were on the sidelines, they noticed a big difference in how the staff handled things. Said they were calm, poised. It was a much different atmosphere on the side than under the previous staff. And previous staffs would be would definitely have, I don't know, they say out of control, but they certainly wouldn't have handled the same way. I think this stems from Rivera and his approach. That's why when it was 17 nothing, I kept thinking, I think they're better than this. I can't say I thought they are going to come back to win. I, I, that would be lying if I said that. But I did feel they put up a strong fight, and that's what Rivera wanted to see. I do remember there are some teams that I've covered here, whether it's a Joe Gibbs team or even when Marty Schottenheimer was here. And Schottenheimer was here, they started off terribly. And I remember just thinking, a Schottenheimer team is better than this. And they, sure enough, they recovered to win at an 8 out of 11. And I thought, like, with the way this summer went, with not so much, there was so much craziness, obviously, but I did think that the, some of the stuff that he was imparting to them, getting you know the things that they were trying to shape, it, they, they were better than, than 17 nothing and looking the way they did. Anyways, they proved that to be true. But it's also about what Rivera said about offensive coordinator Scott Turner. Rivera said afterward that Turner was reaching at times. They had a conversation, and Turner adjusted, and that was that. But I have a real hard time... With, with Gruden ever thinking that Gruden would ever interject, interject that strongly with, say, Greg Minuski. I don't think that ever happened. I, think, I know there were some people there who wished that he would go up to him and say, hey, these are the blitzes that I know work against us. Let's incorporate these. I don't know that that really ever happened. I'm not necessarily trying to pick on him. I'm just highlighting a key difference in why I felt like you know, people would try to predict season records for this team. There were so many 2-14s and 3-13s. and, three and 13s. It's like there, there's a big difference in the coaching staffs, and that matters, even in, a, even in a year like this. Rivera wants to hold players accountable, and I think he'll do that with his coaches too. Turner ended up calling a nice game in the second half. Upon first glance, it seemed like, it seemed like I have to go back and watch the game, but it seemed like they ditched a lot of the two-back sets that they went heavy with in the first half. I, think they, I know they still use some, but it did seem like they were a little bit more varied in the second half. Regardless, Rivera did what a head coach is supposed to do. He led, not just the players, but his other coaches. It's refreshing. I don't think many people could endure what Rivera has in his role as Washington's head coach this summer and in his own life with cancer and then, and then go out and lead a comeback like this. And it's why the team gave him a game ball in the locker room afterwards. Mike and I will talk about this later, but I also want to touch on Rivera's decision to go for it on fourth down late in the game with the score tied. It would have been an easy and short field goal. This wasn't about analytics suggesting they go for it. Rather, it was about an offense that had momentum and a coach that wants to build a mindset. He also, Rivera knew that if they didn't make it, that the defense had been playing well and they would have had Philadelphia pinned deep 
and they probably would get the ball back to at least get maybe another field goal attempt. Anyway, but I also know he wants to get the mindset. And I remember a long time ago when Bill Parcells took over in New England, and the thing that always struck me that year, this is like in the, this is the 90s, mid-90s, but what struck me at that t- point watching the Patriots that year, he'd go for it seemingly on any fourth down and short. Even if they failed, it was about creating a mindset and a belief. Rivera said he wanted his players to know that he believes in them. This season is about building a strong foundation, and that's part of it. Kicking the field goal would have been just fine. They would have gone up 20-17, to 17, and the way the defense is playing, they'd probably go on to win. But rolling the dice paid such a bigger dev- dividend, not just getting a touchdown lead, but it's about the belief and the mindset. That's going to pay off now and down the road. Now, on quarterback Dwayne Haskins, and I've said this season for him is about more than just stats. You look at the talent around them, and it's still there's a long ways to go with creating what they need to to maximize this offense. What I didn't like today, he was inaccurate early, not just overthrows, but on some that were also short. That's unusual for him as far as the short throws. He often misses high. He looked tense in the pocket and unsure at times. The line didn't always help. I saw Wes Martin giving up some pressure early. And Jaron Christian, man, he's got to learn how to reach with his feet. Too often he reaches with his arms, and when you do that, you're asking for trouble. You get in bad position, and you're off balance right away. It's going to be an issue that he has to correct. But with Haskins, I liked how he competed. At halftime, he had not played well overall, and yet he felt the urge to give a halftime speech. He wasn't hanging his head. But I also liked the slam passes they called from on the first touchdown drive, after Fabian Moreau's interception. I felt that, plus his run earlier, helped him find a better rhythm. Those were good, easy throws for him to make. I like that Haskins has shown he'll hang tough even in ugly games. Detroit last year, for example. He was better in the second half. I felt the play call, and I'm going to go back and watch and just see where I felt he was better. I felt the play calling helped, but Haskins definitely settled in. There is a long way to go with him. He's now had eight NFL starts. This year, we need to see his traits, and even though he looked bad early, he was able to still help lead a win. That is a positive. Again, Mike and I will get into the defense shortly, but uh, real quickly on Chase Young, what you saw from him is what we saw during our two weeks watching training camp. The dude is just different. He's mature and a true pro already. He's going to be really good. I don't need to keep wasting time telling you that. That's just reality. There were some definite hiccups defensively early, though. They looked bad. The middle of the field was bad. Carson Wentz did miss some deep balls later, so they you know, could have been a little bit worse. But once that front got going, it was kind of over. It was There was just such a confidence that seeped through that, but they also certainly dented Philadelphia's confidence in offense. And I liked how Del Rio created pressure at times. Ryan Kerrigan's first sack, for example, came because of a Troy Aki blitz off the edge. Against a makeshift line, especially in the year, especially in an, after an offseason like this, you need to test those communication skills of a line and their ability to work together. This did that because when Apke came off the corner, two guys went at him. Nobody stayed with Ryan Kerrigan, who was on that side, left wide open, goes and gets the sack. On the fourth and four, that resulted in a Bostic sack. Kevin Pierre Lewis also showed blitz inside. So they were both, it was going to be look like a double A gap blitz. So center Jason Kel- Kelsey slides to his left to pick up Kevin Pierre Lewis only to watch Pierre Lewis drop. Bostic gets home free. I think you also know that I'm a big Jimmy Moreland fan. I laugh at how the People's Corner nickname nickname has caught on. I called him that last summer because of how many people were fans of his. I probably heard more about him from fans than most than than certainly than what would be what you'd expect from a low round pick. But it told me, it showed me just how much people liked him, liked what he could do. And I think that's true in the building as well. Anyways, they wanted him on the field, and it's easy to see why. The dude competes. On this pick, it was a matter of knowing there was pressure coming from his side. I think it was Cameron Curl coming off the edge, so he knew the ball would come out quick. He saw it. He reacted fast. It was a smart play. Good instincts. And I think one of the things to watch for with him, and I've told you this before, 
but they liked him outside. And, I, and I've said that before, and he was filling in for, for Kendall Fuller, but they like him outside. And they also felt like when he was in college, all they did was play press man. So he didn't know how to play all these other different techniques. Now he does. Now he's he can play, I think, with a little more knowledge behind him. Last year, he was going off instincts and ball skills. So sometimes he'd guess right, and it would look good in practice. Other times he wouldn't, and it would look really bad. But now, to me, what I saw was a guy who's a lot more consistent in practice, and you saw that today. I thought he also did a good job coming up to tackle when he had to a couple times. And I think he even beat a lineman on one play to break up a screen. Um, so I think there's a lot of things you know, that you can look for and say that was pretty good. I won't go overboard seeking meaning from, one, from just one game. There are 15 more to go, and who knows what happens in Arizona next week or in anywhere else the weeks after. But I love that after a tumultuous offseason, Washington was tested in a massive way and they found a way to come back and win against a team they considered the measuring stick in the division. It's probably good that no fans attended this game and won't this season. After the last few years, the fan base is rightfully scarred and you wonder what it would have sounded like had they been at the game and it's 17 nothing. Probably a lot of booze because you just, I'm going to go by Twitter. That's what you're hearing on there. Would that have had an impact? I don't know. But I know that this team needs to show the fan base what it can do and convince them that they need to get behind them fully again. And I think you know this. The fan base will do that once they have a reason to, to get it behind it fully. So maybe it's good that they can show who they are without any reactions to their growing pains and let them kind of grow in silence because I think you'll like it eventually in the end. Okay, that's it for me. After this break, Mike Jones from USA Today And the Football Jones podcast will join me to go over the game. Support for this podcast comes from CDW and Hewlett Packard Enterprise. At CDW, we get modern servers need to be flexible. Flexible, scalable, and predictable. I predicted you'd say that. Okay, what would I say next? Probably something about server security. Impressive and freaky. CDW can implement secure Hewlett Packard Enterprise Gen 10 servers that improve speed and performance while reducing costs. While reducing costs. See, predictable. IT orchestration by CDW. People who get it. I predict a web address. CDW.com slash HPE. I'm in your mind, man. You've heard me talking about Low Note Coffee for a couple months now. Let me tell you a little bit about who they are and what they're about. Low Note Coffee is based in the Shenandoah Valley. Just a nice bunch of people who are open for business during this trying time. Just look at their website, LoneOakCoffee.com, and what do they highlight? Their core values of quality, family, transparency. They work with co-op farmers from all over the world to source their beans. They also support small farmers to find the right beans. During this pandemic, one of my saving graces has been grinding my beans from Lone Oak Coffee and taking a few minutes before the day to savor the coffee, get my mind right. Put a little jazz or Frank Sinatra or Louis Armstrong on in the background, it's even better. I've enjoyed all their blends, but among my favorites, the Ethiopian Guji, love the berry flavor, the Mexican Chiapas, and their house blend. Start your day off right with Lone Oak Coffee. Visit LoneOakCoffee.com, that's L-O-N-E-O-A-K, coffee.com. Use promo code COFFEE2020 for a discount. You can thank me later. All right, well, it was, a, it was fun to see Mike Jones in the press box before the game. I didn't think we'd be sitting there after the game talking about a win, though, Mike. And since I got you here, you know, you haven't been around this team. I'm curious, you know, your first impression of seeing these guys live and what, you, what, what are you coming away with from this game? Yeah, I really thought that there was no way they were going to be sending me back here anytime soon because they only like sending me to compelling matchups. <laughs> um, and I looked at you... And we were like, ah, there won't be a whole lot of visits to FedEx Field for me. But the way they turned it around, I felt like we saw Dwayne Haskins take a step toward growing up. And the defense, they got in sync. All those young guys and the old guy, Ryan Kerrigan. Um, And I also felt like Ron Rivera was exactly what this team needed. Um, He talked about how he felt like even Scott Turner was reaching on some right. things. You know, first year, we nice talk about the players being young guys and growing. But he, one of his coaches, he said, you know, I thought Scotty was reaching on some things. And I told him, look, we don't have a 17-point play. Let's take them one at a time. And he said Jack Del Rio was rusty as well. 
And then we saw them really take on the mindset of their coach, the personality, taking it patiently, working, playing within themselves. And so I was impressed with the defensive pressure and also the patience and balance of that offense in the second half. And you've been around this franchise long enough to know how things often go here. Right. And, you know, I think you, you hit it, though, in, with taking on the personality of the head coach. It, it's hard to find that right away. And we don't know where this is going to go. Right. But you did see a team that didn't panic, kept playing hard. All the things that he's preached, that there was a steadiness to them, even though they were down like that. So, you know, it, it, it definitely felt like they did that. I mean, that's that hasn't happened here very often in the past. Or to be honest, Mike, if it did happen, it was a personality of the head coach. And yeah. that kind of led to some other issues. Exactly. Exactly. And that was a thing that hurt them. Today it helped them. And look, we know there's going to be tough games. The Eagles had four offensive linemen who were out, um, and they were reshuffling things. That's not going to happen every time. You're not going to get eight sacks and right. two interceptions and a forced fumble every single time. But they're seeing a formula here that can help them for future performances. What jumped out with you about Dwayne Haskins then? Um, I felt like the second half, when they went with more of an up-tempo attack, he looked like he was confident. He was going to guys. Um, and you saw him getting his rhythm. Um, first half, we saw him aggressive pulling down the ball and running some. But we saw his mechanics need some work here. Right. But again, when I heard, when Ron said that Dwayne stood up in the locker room and was very passionate and getting those guys going, you said, that's what you want to see about a kid who has been spending the whole offseason trying to learn how to lead. That's the kind of stuff you want to see out of him. It is. And I think the other thing he did which was he didn't turn the ball over. Right. So despite a really bad start for him, and it was bad. He was inaccurate. He was missing. There are a lot of reasons for it, including his own play. But the fact that he doesn't turn the ball over, I think, is a pivotal thing for this team. It was almost like someone brought up, the, you know, it was Alex Smith-like for a while. Right. Where don't put them in a bad spot. You may, not, you may be struggling. Don't put them in a bad spot. And now he did have the one fumble. But, the, you know, that was Jaron Christian's fault. Right, right, but exactly. But he, he did not put him in a bad spot. Exactly. So that, well, that was one thing to see, too. What did you think, too, then, with, with the defense and Chase Young in particular? Well, I, I saw a kid, as, um, you know, his, his teammates said, as good as advertised. Right. Um, he was really wreaking havoc all over the place. Um, you know, and he was creating opportunities for his teammates right. because of his disruption. And so, yeah, we saw a kid who was super aggressive, maybe a little bit too aggressive early on, but he learned from that and figured out how to channel it. So, man, if they can get him to figure out how to channel that aggression and know how to, when to pin back his ears, when to be careful, that is fantastic for them and for him. But you know what I liked about because we asked him about that, the jumping offside or yeah. jump the neutral zone infraction early. And he basically was like, yeah, okay, I did it. Right. It's one play. Right. So I like the mindset that he showed. There's a maturity, and I don't know how much you've been able to talk to him. There's a definite maturity about that guy. And you hear it when he talks about Ryan Kerrigan. Right. He, the way he, the, the glowing things he says about him, and I do believe it's genuine. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I was impressed with that, too, because sometimes you get a young guy in there and they just really want to make a name for themselves there. There's clear respect yeah. for Ryan, um, and that's good because you want to learn how to have longevity right. in this league here, and Ryan is a great example of how to, to last in this league here, and... I think that it, that it's great for him to be able to watch and observe a guy like that. And also with Ryan setting the franchise sack record too. I mean, again, you've been around him a lot. It's you know he is a he is a great example. He's I would never have considered I've never considered him one of the elite pass rushers in this league because his numbers aren't at that point. He's been a very good pass rusher though, yeah. and I think that showed you know, just getting that sack record mm -hmm. here. I think shows that. Yeah, exactly. He is um, consistent, Right. he's reliable, he's durable, um, and, and he approaches the game the right way. No, he might not be as dynamic as far as a bag of creative crazy tricks, but he works hard, he's strong, and he's uh, relentless. And that'll get you in this league for a really long time, and this is a perfect situation for him here right now, I think, where you've got a lot of young guys, and then you can come in there, you're fresh, pick your spots, and I know that he really loves the game and, and loves being a part of this franchise. Right, and I think the other thing what it shows too, there, I think having 
at this stage in his career, having guys like Sweat and Young in ahead of him mm -hmm. can help extend it too, because exactly. it puts him in a very, maybe a little bit less play time, but maybe some more, some really advantageous roles for him. Meaningful too. plays, right? right? You know, and, and I had asked him this off season. We were talking about Luke Keekley, and he was saying he understood why he retired. Um, and I said, why are you still playing? And he's like, well, I still feel good. I love it, and I want my daughter to remember me playing, not just hear about me playing. Mm -hmm. I want her to remember seeing me play. Well, this is a great situation for him because, you get, like you said, this can extend it. He's playing for something special right there, and it's just it's working. I think it's going to work out well for him. It is funny, too, because, I mean, I know it also matters to him to stay in Washington yeah. for his whole career because he wants to be someone, and he's always said, I even talked to him about this a couple times, either at the end of the year or in the off season because he wants to be here when it turns around. He right. feels like there's, God bless the guy, he always feels like it's around the corner. Exactly. But, but maybe now with Rivera, I think people feel like maybe this time it could be that way if they let this guy, if they don't, you know, you know, give this guy, you know, whatever problems, uh, send him to the hospital because he's yeah. just, you know, they, they, all the stuff that goes on here. But, you know, I mean, it does matter to Kerrigan to, to be part of this thing. And I think you want guys like that to be here. Oh, for sure. Um, and, and, I mean, again, the way he approaches it is the right way, and that's the kind of guys you want your guys learning from, your young guys. Um, it's important for the locker room. He might not be as a rah-rah guy speaking in that locker room, but leading from example. Um, and understanding also his role, being realistic about his skill set and how he fits right now. Um, that's a great thing for young guys to understand as well. So we've we've seen a lot of his offense, obviously working through training camp. And again, you know, for you, your first impression here, right. like, what, what are you thinking of this offense early in the game? Well, early in the game, I really was just struck by how they really don't have a lot of guys right. that are game changers. Um, and as a result, I think that that kind of hurt um, uh, Terry McLaurin because you don't have anybody else to, to take some pressure off. Um, but I do think that eventually that started helping because they were keying on, on, on McLaurin and other guys started becoming open. Also, I, I was just kind of wondering where the spark was going to come from. They started going to some quick hitters and things like that to help Haskins get into a rhythm. So I see the potential there for, for the creativity, um, for them to move the ball. Still questions about their run game, obviously. But again, there's a lot of young guys who are trying to, as Ron said, there's a lot of good football players who just haven't had a chance to express themselves yet as football players. And so maybe the pieces are there. They just have to learn this league, learn the speed of it. Um, you know, I, I still think they're a couple pieces away. Sure. You know, um, but there are young guys who are going to get meaningful snaps. Um, and, and again, Scott Turner is going to be learning how to put them in better situations. And I think as that's well. a, I think that's a really good point because you forget even when like Sean McVay was here, remember right. how long it took him yeah. to find a stride, and he even admitted like even like into his second year doing it that mm -hmm. he was still learning because there was a famous thing with or the one scene with him and Kirk on the bench talking right. about how hey I'm still learning too. Right. It does take time, and Scott's grown up in this game, but so did Sean, and right. so it, it can take time. But the other thing too with that pass rush. Going back to that side of the ball is Jimmy Moreland was talking about this after the game and Fabian Moreau too, like what it does for the defensive backs and knowing that, okay, they're going to have to get the ball out. I mean, right. that just, that hasn't been something that's happened. They've yeah. had good sack numbers, right. but they haven't had that kind of pressure. They've had it coming from one guy or two guys sometimes. Right. They haven't had it coming from all over the place. You could look at Carson Wentz and you could see that he was really, his eyes were darting and he was trying to get rid of that ball as quickly as he could and things weren't able to unfold. Right. Um, there was a pass play to Zach Ertz late in the game that he had to get rid of a little sooner than he would have wanted to um, because he knew guys were coming from all different directions there. And that's something that Washington has not had. Right. You've had guys that you could double team and neutralize the pass rush. Right. Um, now you have, you know, you've got four first round guys um, in the last four years, you right. know, and you know, you you should be getting you should that be type getting of that. Thing. I right. think, and I think pairing it with Del Rio is going right. to be a big help. But there were times too where Wentz's athleticism has hurt these guys in the past. Right, it didn't hurt them. No. Now there were a couple times where he almost escaped. You go, okay, here it comes, yeah. and then somebody was there to clean it up, right. and that was another difference too. Or he had to throw it away or right. something like that. There were no magic. Oh my gosh, here he goes again. Plays right. that we've seen out of him sometimes. 
Um, you know, I remember Josh Norman always talking about that guy. You think you got him, and then right. he, well, there was nowhere for him to go. He avoided some sacks and threw him away. But he also, you know, they got lucky on one of them that would have been a third interception there because right. you know, and yeah. his own infraction. Yeah. Um, so uh, we'll see. And there. another one that Fabian Moreau almost had too, right. the second one. So yes. it was big. And then you know, because again, like they are, they are getting guys through. So if you're if you you know Matt Ioannidis is all over the place, yeah. and so. There were times where the pocket is starting to collapse and he starts to move and the guy's right there because he's free. Exactly. So again, that's that's gonna be something to watch. But so your biggest takeaway from this game would be what with Washington? Um, they're young, they're going to grow. Um, and Ron Rivera is the right guy. Just his his approach and um, his leadership style. The thing I thought was great was when he talked about going for that fourth down. Correct. It wasn't just for today. Right. That was a move for the future because he said, I made a mistake when I, in my first couple years where I didn't make calls like that. And it kind of took us a little longer to grow and build that trust with each other. I wanted the guys to know that I believe in them. And as a result, he thinks it's going to pay off down the road. So, look, they've got some young talent. They've got guys that we don't know about. But I think they're going to learn a lot, and they're going to learn the right way. All right, Mike. I appreciate you joining me. Thanks. Good to see you. All right, man. Thanks. Good to see you, too. That's it for this time. Thank you to Lono Coffee for their continued support. And thank you for listening. No Therapy Thursday needed this week. How about that? But I will have former Washington tight end Logan Paulson on to go over what he saw in the opener. And we'll talk a little bit about the Arizona matchup. Talk to you next time.